Joe Pesci's. Chewing on his tooth, I thought he was going to stab me with a fork. Welcome to uh, Significant by the Yak. It's a podcast. Well, thank you, Nigel. Always a pleasure. No, I haven't introduced you oh, yet. Okay, Jesus so, uh, Christ. Well, you don't know. do your thing. It's like he just and he's never shuts up. <laughs> I'm ready to get out the gate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here today with uh, Mark Baker. Um, how to describe Mark Baker? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with the, uh, the, uh, the OG skateboarder. From back in the day, uh, that was a big thing. The uh, the legendary New York club owner, and uh, lately uh, raiser of wolves. Welcome, Mr. Baker. Well, thank you, Nigel. It's always a pleasure to share a beer and some banter with you. <laughs> <laughs> you need to add barefoot farmer, semi club guy, wolf whisperer, wolf whisperer, happily living in Bali. Yeah, well, here we are in Bali at <laughs> a beautiful um, Double Espresso Studios in. The heart of Kuta. <laughs> the first for both of us, I think, right? Yeah, this is the first first time I've been down here probably since like 1982. Yeah. When the club next door here, Bounty, was, you know, the centre of all the action. But wasn't it just though? It was. Yeah, you know, the right. Kuta cowboy, pirate, bikers. Or, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, predating. The chicks. Pre-dating. I mean, there was no phones. There was, there was nothing. <laughs> Everyone was topless on the beach. The good old days. Yeah, right. Frisbees and those Frisbees. dreadful things people used to wear. <laughs> the men. Speedos. Sort of, oh, no, no. It was before that. It was before like, sort of pouch, wasn't it? Yeah, so, pouch. We used to make our own pouches. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Ronnie. <laughs> Ronnie Singer. Shout out, Ronnie. Singer. Rest in peace. Rest yeah, in Ronnie, peace, Ronnie. Who I, I think you met in, uh, or met he met you in in New York, right? Yeah, New, yeah. Ronnie was a, was a was a figure back in uh, the early. Early eighties, also, uh, uh, yeah, he, yeah, 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 he was a figure in New York. Yeah, R.I.P. Ronnie. Yeah, man. But you're you're not American. No, I am. Uh, I was actually born in England. Um, uh, had a, <laughs> a weird and wonderful and dysfunctional childhood. I was. Uh, I I joined a. a you know, my parents, my father died, and everyone everyone seemed to die. <laughs> and um, you know, traveling circus, Chipperfields came to town. Um, when I was uh, eight or nine, um, I was pretty much running amok and unsupervised. So I joined the circus and ran away for a couple of years. It's amazing. So it was, it was actually a, a circus, like with animals and stuff. A real circus. Lions so I always assumed and tigers it was like tigers and elephants. Yeah, all of that. I've heard the stories before. I always assumed it was like the waltzes or something. No, <laughs> no, it was the real deal. Back in the day, you know, oh, I mean, there was there was a lot of travelling circuses. You know, and we're talking what are we talking? Late late sixties, early no, it's early early seventies yeah. in England. Where you know, the, you know, they had a lot of traveling circuses. Chipperfields, the circus I was with, was was one of the biggest um, back then. When when we didn't know better, and they had you know they had animals, mm. yeah, lions, tigers, elephants. Did the you whole just thing. sort of walk in one day and? No, I they they had what they called the advance crew. So the advance crew would come in up two weeks before the show, um, do all the posting, fly posting, billboards. I went down there looking for a job. You know, I was, I was freaking nine years old, you know. Wow. And, um, and I went in there and a couple of days later, I was uh, stuck on top of a van with the music blaring, dressed up in a monkey suit mm. or dressed up as a clown with the speakers blaring music. The circus is coming to town. The wow. And I was waving at all the kids and uh, doing all the advanced promo. And then when the circus left, left town, I sort of went with it. Um, you know, my mother was in the middle of multiple nervous breakdowns over the death of my father. Um, and, uh, and off I went, you know, but, you know, it was, I mean, it was fun and it was glamorous and I was cleaning up a lot of lion shit and but, taking care of cubs. And, and who was taking care of you? Good nine. question. Um, look, I mean, you know, there's a lot of sinister people out there, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and I fell into it. I was, you know, I mean, I, was, I had to hustle. I was, I was hustling at a young age. If, if I wasn't doing it, no one else was doing it. You know, England... In the early seventies, was uh, you know, it was a, it was a, could, could, could be a pretty rough place. So uh, I just had to survive. So I went out there. Did you have an auntie or some? You know, no, I, I actually made, that... I made I made friends with right. with one of the trapeze artists actually. Her family, um, mm. they were Russian, um, and she sort of took me under her wing, uh, and, and I have the fondest memories of her. 
and her family. Um, but you know, it was you know, it was a rough place traveling around England. You had you had the, you had the traveling fairs as well. It was all the pikeys mm. um, and the and when you know the circus and the. Can we still say that word? Pikeys. Yeah. yeah what's wrong with that? Pikeys. <laughs> is, there, is there a more appropriate word for it? Well, the fair boys. We're calling them the fair boys. Yeah, the fair yeah. boys. And we, you know, the circus, the ring boys who put up, put up, put up the tents and yeah, did the, the waltzes, yeah. did all the all, all of the all of the, the, the grunt work. Yeah. Um, we, you know, occasionally we would meet in a in a city or a town, and and off it would go. People were getting killed and stabbed and murdered and mm. left in woods and buried, and you know, it was terrible. But what a big fighting kind of big culture. Fight, big yeah. fight. I mean, you, know, you got a hundred hundred guys from you know working the circus, the ring yeah. boys, and, and they were a tough lot. And a lot, a lot of people who join the circus are looking to be anonymous. Right. Or, or the or the or the fair boys. It's a bit like the kind of English Foreign Legion, really. Yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> so you'd run away, don't but you? That, to you, hide. You'd run, you'd yeah. run, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, this is before computers and you know national records and all the rest of it. Everything, you know, it was uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to be anonymous and they ran away. So I met the weird and the wonderful and the beautiful and the rough and the tough and there were wonderful moments of beauty and there were extremely ugly. Mm. Violent, horrible, nasty people out there as well. Right. But it was it was a good training ground. Then I um, then I came back to uh, back to to Brighton where I was born. By then, you know, I mean, it's really difficult to fit back into being like a proper little eleven year old when you've been out there carrying a gun for the past couple of years. Mm. You know what I mean? So, so uh, I was. It was just it was what it was. And then skateboarding came along. Yeah. So you, I mean, it was at that time when it arrived in England, right? Yeah, it was a couple yeah, of years later. Those. It was like you yeah. know, by twelve, thirteen. You know, yeah. we, we were getting the you know this phenomenal called skateboarding, and they had these little wooden boards and then plastic yeah. boards, and then they became quite sophisticated. I had so much frigging time on my hands because I wasn't allowed in school. You know, I was a bad influence, and right. apparently, I just wanted some attention, really. Right. And um, and that was it. I was, so I spent all my time when everyone else was at school. I was out on the street skateboarding, mm. and I got quite good at it. And right. um, and then when the whole thing blew up, you know, then I, you know, and, and you know, you've got to imagine a Brighton. You know, I mean, you know, England. You know, Brighton has quite a reputation for having, you know, a mixed lot. It's a it's a it's a it's a violent town. You know. It's, mm. Well, I think that I don't think there was an unviolent town in England, in England at that back time. In Mosley, yeah. I know? mean, you used to go and you know scrap on the terraces, you know, yeah. for your football team and or your soccer team, whatever yeah. they call it. And uh, yeah, so so everybody around me was, you know, and Brighton has a big antiques trade, so there's lots of what we call knocker boys that would go, you know, robbing right. people's houses and post right, offices. Right, and right, right. It was villainy everywhere. Yeah, um, yeah. But then yeah. you also had the aristocracy that lived in Brighton that. Moved out of London, you had all the, all the They gangsters. didn't have any trouble there, did they? Well, no, but they all started to buy houses next to each other. Yeah, and they, yeah right. They, you yeah, know, yeah. Because they were all making money. Yeah. So you had all the villains who were making money mm. from, from their activities. And, and, of course, when you're on the streets, which is what we were as skateboarders, we, we were living on the streets 18, 20 hours a day. Mm. Um, and then, but this, it was, skateboarding was wonderful because it just sort of, instead of like hanging around at like big shopping centres and places and, and just going robbing or doing doing bad things, you'd put all your energy into skateboarding. And I, and I certainly didn't want to, you know, I had a couple of, I had my collar felt a couple of times, with, you know, minor things like, you know, smoking pot or something like that. Mm. And, um, and, uh, and, and and just skateboarding, just, I was able to channel all my energies into skateboarding. And then when skateboarding blew up... So it did blow up, and I remember this, because there was a time at which, you know, local councils started talking about, oh, well, you must have skate parks. Exactly, it was a, exactly. You were a vandal, man, if you had a, a skateboard, weren't you? Because you'd, yeah, be, you'd well, be out looking for places to... Yeah, well, skateboarding was illegal in a lot of places. We were getting chased yeah. by the cops everywhere. You were just looking for good curves to kind of ride, right? I mean, exactly. and they just weren't there. Exactly. And um, then councils sort of started to take it seriously, started to sort of build... Some yeah, and, you know, and we, we were getting these. I mean, you know, we were we were. In, hey, it was like, you know, come on, you saw these. All the magazines started to come out. And yeah. There was this guy Tony Alva and Jay. Well, it was going off in America, wasn't it? Yeah, this is where and, it came and from the there. initial gang, the the, the, the anti hero bad boys of skateboarding, were the Dogtown boys. Right. You know, it was, Tony, Mad Dog Tony Alva, Jay right. Adams, Jimmy Plumer, Steve Olson, you know, Hackett Plumer, all of these f- incredible characters, very charismatic, and they had these incredible photographs and these incredible skate parks they had with right. giant, you know, pipes and pools. And, right. and we, you know, we used to sit there you know, for days yeah. waiting for the next issue to come out yeah. and, and emulate them. Yeah. And then when skateboarding started to get bigger in England, um, uh, and then you know I, I got a manager and I was on tour around England. I started winning competitions. So how did that? I mean, were you kind of spotted, or did you get yeah, into no, a competition? They started, you know, these amateur competitions right. and contests, and you know, they'd slalom, and then they started to build ramps and half pipes, right. and then these <laughs> dodgy skate parks that were like awful, but awful, but, but they were yeah. better, you know, better than nothing. Yeah. And um, and then when it started to become big, big business. 
you know, I mean, it was big business. And, and I was getting, you know, I, I, I was getting paid to skateboard and mm. travel around England and do shows. And, of course, mm. I put the razzle-dazzle on. And, the ma- and then we started to have our own magazines. Right. So I, you know, I was called was a Mad Mark Baker because I was doing mad shit. Mm. <laughs> and, and, um, and then the Americans started to come in. And, and one day, um, my absolute all-time hero of the day was a guy called, you know, Mad Dog Tony Alva. And yeah. his manager, my manager, spoke, said, well, why don't we put these guys together and go on a tour around England? Mad wow. Dog, Tony and Mad Mark Baker. And that was it, mate. I was, I was like, me, go on tour with Tony Alva? You're fucking Incredible. crazy. Incredible, yeah. It's yeah. like going like Brad Pitt uh, calling. It was nuts. Yeah. It was, and, then, and then on top of that, to be honest with you, I mean, Tony, you know, had, was an, had an incredible style, but he wasn't a big trickster. Right. But I was doing stuff that was apparently. I've seen some than of history. the early uh, videos, just you guys in like these cement tubes, you know, <laughs> just doing the, the ram, we ram, nuts, ram from one end yeah. to the other, you know, <laughs> and going so high it just looked incredible. No helmets or any shit no like that. Helmet. No, we were getting broken wrists, broken ankles. Bro- I mean, we were getting smashed to pieces. But of course, uh, there, were no, there were no swimming pools in England, but eventually you must have got well, into. Well, in the, California, they yeah. you know when they had the wildfires, they'd empty out the pools and go skate. Right. Um, so tell us about how you you managed to get from uh, Brighton, England, and doing all that to, well, to America. Well, well, so, so this, you know, Tony's manager, a guy called Pete Zender. Um, shout out to Peter. Shout out Pete Zender. Is he still alive? Um, yeah, he's still alive. Wow. <laughs> um, Shogo Cuba. So anyway, he came over and uh, we went on tour and we were, we were like, you know, we were quite, we knew how to work the press. We, you know, we were, we were showmen. And, um, and we went on tour and then they said, well, you know, the guy goes to me, you know, the manager goes, and me and Tony hit it off, of course. You know, we were part. I mean, they were groupies, yeah. skate groupies. We were sure. we were rock stars at, that, at 15 years old. It was when well, you insane. combined also the the whole circus kind of yeah, promotion it was thing. Yeah, let's put it on a show yeah, and let's get show, crazy. Yeah. And we were doing like we were doing crazy stuff on skateboards. Mm. I mean, we were like massive, you know, four, five, six foot aerials out of these dodgy swimming. But I mean, now of course, you know, Tony Hawk and those kids, they've got perfect transitions and wood, and mm. these these were like dodgy concrete fucking pools. Yeah, and we were getting smashed to pieces. But anyway, so we went on tour, and then the guy says. Oh, you know, do you want to come on tour with us? Do you, we're going to Paris. Do you want to come to Paris? I was like, do I want to fucking go to Paris? Yeah, you fuck, what's I fucking do? So, uh, so I hopped on a plane and went to Paris and then we toured around Europe and then Tony goes, do you, you want to come and visit me in California? And I was 15. I was like, do I wow. want to go to California and stay with Tony Alvo? Like, wow. this is it. This is my ticket yeah. out of big, like, I potentially I was going to go to jail probably for the rest of my life, you know. And um, and that was it. Off I went on Freddie Laker, fifty-seven pound. Freddie Laker, shout out to Freddie Shout Laker. out Freddie Laker. He's, he's not around anymore, but what a guy! I, was, I remember you know, he I really remember. opened it up, opened up he, the skies. I, I man. was listening to Super Tramp Breakfast in America yeah. on the headphones, and I was like, I am fifteen years old. I'm going to California wow. to stay with my absolute fucking hero. That's incredible. And um, and that was it. And then the rest is history. That's a on. real pinch me kind of moment, though. On it the was plane t- over there, yeah. Nigel, I was like, sitting there looking at everyone going in and out of jail. In and out of villainy, and 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 here's my and I didn't want to, I didn't have any education. I, I hadn't gone to school, you know. I was street smart, but I wasn't educated smart. And um and here comes this opportunity to to break out, and that was it. Once I started, I never stopped. I never I never stopped travelling since uh, since I was fifteen. Absolutely, and, and, then, and then arriving, up. you know, arriving in California. And, and, anyway, yeah. and then I'm scared these people. But, you know, the thing was, was that, you know, the Californians had never really heard of, like, you know, good old England and France. Yeah, yeah. They didn't expect us to skate. But I went out there, honestly, and I was blowing it up. Right. So I placed, uh, I placed second, you know, world championship out there back in the day. And then suddenly I was like, holy fuck, this is crazy fucking Englishman. Because I've seen, seen those old <laughs> skateboard videos and competition stuff in America yeah. as well. There was a stage at which people were, like, doing... Weird gymnastics shit on on skateboards. Well, they were, yeah, there was, well, there was the odd, guys that were doing the streets, like they were doing handstands yeah, on skateboards and, and all this you know, tic tacking and around yeah. and them. But we weren't those guys. Right. <laughs> we right. did it, but but we were like, give us yeah. a swimming pool and let's see how, how yeah. high we can fly out of there, yeah. or how we can roll into the pool. And then, of course, half the time, you know, we flew out of the pool, but coming back in, the truck, you know, the board got stuck on the edge of the pool, and we yeah, end up right. you know, with two broken wrists and yeah. concussion in hospital. But mm. um, but you know. I, it was just, it's just this, it wasn't just skateboarding, you know, and we could talk for hours about that, but it was, we started wearing hats and T-shirts and, and clothes and, and, and certain sneakers, like vans, right. van shoes. Van, wow. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody on the planet owns a pair of vans, right? They right? do, Bali, yeah, yeah. We started that. Yeah. Really? You know, we started the colours. Yeah, they, they, were, they were one. They were yeah. tennis shoes. We yeah. started craning them in, blue and red, black huh. and white. It blew up, you know. Mm. And of course, they made billions, and we made nothing. Mm. But um, but but we started this. It wasn't just that. And then Vision Streetwear came along, you know, casual streetwear. 
all came from skateboarding. Right. And, um, and, and the apparel company started, you know, like relating to the phenomenon which was, you know, the Dogtown Boys and right. our... Oh, and, and T-shirts our became t-shirts. a thing, right? I mean, I mean there just weren't it, it T-shirts before, it right? It changed the so way in England, there was the, there was a smiley kind of came. And then after yeah. that, yeah. yeah, it was and just... It's, and, it's, and it's still affected. So skateboarding, look, had this, you know, this phenomenal um, sort of, you know, impact. And then it, all of a sudden it shut down because, you know, for whatever reason, skate parks and insurances and, mm. you know, people started biking and rollerblading. I thought it would never end. Um, right. We all thought it would never end and it did end. Right. You know, come, like come, fad that stopped, Come at yeah. 80... Was it the BMX thing? Yeah, BMX yeah, came in. It, BMX yeah, started yeah. coming into the skate parks. But people were getting Music hurt and they couldn't, they couldn't afford... Yeah. I mean, when mm-hmm. we started, it was all punk rock and, and rock and roll. Right. The Dam, The Clash, Sex right. Pistols. Um, and then uh, and then it changed. And, and that was when suddenly I was sitting there back in Brighton. I was like, oh, fuck, what are we going to do now? Mm. You know, skateboarding's finished. Um, God. So you went to, back to Brighton? <laughs> yeah. Yeah I, was, yeah, I was forced to go back to Brighton. Mm. <laughs> and... Um, and I sat there and I said, like, well, what am I going to do now? Gosh. You know, and then a couple of years of ups and downs and, you know, potential disasters again. And then um, I was like, I, I can't. You know, I've got that travel bug. Um, and, and I see the life that my friends are living in Brighton or my old uh, accomplices. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I just, I'm not going to go to prison. Mm. And uh, again. And, um, and I just, and I got lucky. I was in Greece one year and met these guys from New York. And, uh, and I was driving around Brighton. I had this whole... Left, left, left-hand drive Porsche, which if you know oh, what that wow. means, it means it's in, in England they all drive on the other side of the road. Oh, so yeah. I just left took a Porsche, yeah. and, wow. uh, and the cops were stopping me every two minutes and uh. harassing me. I was a figure in Brighton, and uh, mm. and I was like, this is never going to end. Three, four times a day. Did you have a club and stuff in Brighton? No, I never had no. a club in Brighton. No, um, uh, no I didn't. Not no. then. Um, but but. You know, it was just—it was just all the—it just all started to become aggressive down there. Right. You know, the, the, all the villains started to sort of clash with. And I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm friendly with everybody, poor, rich, royalty, or, or, or villains. You know, I'm friends with everyone. But it all started to become—it become like a, a little fish pond of a lot of big fish down there that started to get very aggressive with each other. And they were all yeah. my friends. So one day I'm in a toilet stall with, you know, some gangster with half a nose pulls out a gun and mm. tries to shoot a friend of mine and I knew them both and it was just I could just see it was getting really ugly I was like I gotta get out of here before I get in trouble and um and then it was it I come to New York and I and I arrived in New York and the first night I was there we arrived in, you know at the airport and we we're going over the bridge and I'm looking at New York City I'm like holy fuck mm. this is the real deal you know yeah. this is not we're not in Brighton anymore and uh, we sat there and I smoked a joint watching watching the uh, watching watching New York Rumble at night, and I was just like, "Holy shit!" Mm. And then we go in, and we say, "Well, we're going to go to this incredible club. It's the best club. It's called Area down on Hudson Street." We get there. There's 500 people outside. I'm showed up with like six of us, and I look up there on the stand, and one of my old friends, Jules Gate, and was the doorman. Oh no, <laughs> said, man! Oh, dude, this is my first night in New York. That's right? hilarious. And Absolutely there's everyone's like, "Me, me, come here!" Yeah, yeah. No one's getting in for you know. And there's you know, Boy George rolling uh-huh. in and there's this one and that one and Mick Jagger and everyone. <laughs> and uh, the guy sees me That's and he's hilarious, like, oh, man. Baker! Sends his security out. Yeah. It was like the Moses C part. And we oh, just, wow. my friends with me were like, like dude, you just dude. been here one fucking yeah. day and you just cruised the hottest yeah. club in New York. And I just walked into that club and, and you know, hugged everyone, introduced it. And I was like, I'm never leaving this town. <laughs> this is my fucking town. Yeah. And, um, and that was the start of, you know, wow. my... That's oh, given me like kind of goosebumps. Yeah, no, it was great, know. but it was also funny because I arrived at the airport and I didn't have a penny. Right. I had like 20 quid on me, I was like 20 pounds. But I had a Porsche that I'd shipped over. So, right. the, so the immigration guy comes and goes, oh, how long are you staying in America, Mr. Baker? I'm like, well, I don't know, as long as possible, mate. <laughs> he goes, well, how much money do you have? I go, well, I've got 20 pounds. <laughs> he, goes, well, he goes, there's a flight leaving in another hour and you're going to be on it. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't understand. I've got a Porsche. He goes, yeah, right, you've got a fucking Porsche. Yeah. So I was like, no, dude, you've got a Porsche. So my mate Bruno, who I'd met in Greece, who invited me over to New York, um, so he's, he, he walks me out, he goes, I want to see your mate who's got the Porsche. So I get outside and I'm like, they're going to fucking deport me. I've only just got it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, he walks outside, there's my beautiful, sparkling, trimmed up, like, you know, half bashed up fucking 911. <laughs> and uh, the geezer looks at it, he looks at it, he goes, dude, you're going to win. You're uh, going to win, mate. You're uh, welcome, welcome to America. Wow. And he welcome gave me, and, to and America. And he gave me a hug. Yeah, he was, did he yeah, really? he's this blue eyed Irish uh, immigration sweet, officer. He's like, dude, um, you're, you're going to win. You're yeah. going to win. I was like, thank you. Oh, and that was it. Man. And then we, that night we went to the club and, you know, 
fucking God knows what drugs we were doing. Did you know anybody else in the club or? Was um, yeah, I mean, not really. People, yeah. you know, but but you know, within six months, I knew everyone. Right, you were the limey, the <laughs> new guy in town with the Porsche. The yeah, town. yeah, knew the doorman. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> and then of course, you know, we had this car import business, and then that fell apart. Right, and the, then, the um, car import business is kind of interesting. It's not something you could probably do now. That it certainly wouldn't work. Because the dollar, the dollar against the pound was whatever it was. We had these left hooks, so we were importing these you know, Rolls. I was driving around Rolls in New York in a Rolls and a, right. a bunch of Porsche. <laughs> until we smashed them all to pieces and right. the insurance company refused to pay us. Right. And then um, another friend of mine who was like, I was like, dude, what are we going to do now? We've just lost all, you know, whatever savings I had. Mm. He goes, well, look, you know, I'm, I'm delivering furniture and jewellery to, to like, you know, really low-income families in, in the worst neighbourhoods in New York, like the Bronx, Brooklyn, East Brooklyn. Goes, are you door-to-door? Well, no, he, they were selling the furniture, but if they didn't pay, I had to go oh, and get I it back. Oh, I see, you were the... the so I was delivering it first. repo man. Yeah, yeah, well, I was delivering the furniture first. Oh, fuck. 18 floors of fucking oh, crack geez. staircases in Harlem right. on a 103 degree day, you know. Nice. And, uh, yeah. and then I, after they didn't pay, after that, I became the back. repo guy. I had to go Same and get it guy. back. Yeah. And or they, the jewellery They whatever. knew you. Yeah, they yeah, were it like... Was like, you know, Rus- Russian Jewish mob, you know, blah, oh, blah, blah. God. And um, so I became the repo. I was Mr. Sharky. The repo guys. I was wow. carrying a gun up in the Bronx and oh handcuffs, and I was with this crazy Israeli guy, mm. Ron, who had just got out of the paras. And uh, yeah, we the people were looking at us up there. We were like, yeah, they didn't know what the fuck we were. So we, just just to, just just talk about the street a bit, you know, and especially in America and where you're from, and, and in Brighton, obviously in America and in New York, is it's a very different, you know, uh, a lot more. Yeah, people serious. carry guns in America. Yeah, they exactly. don't carry guns anymore. They just cut yeah. you. Yeah, cut you. So. At one point, did you kind of get into the, you know, how to handle and use a gun? And oh gosh, I, I, you know, I mean, look, coming from England, you know, guns to us are but they I mean, just anomaly. Don't exist, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I was seen. carrying a twenty-two air pistol when I was eight. You know, There's that. Yeah, you know, and I was shoot I mean, birds, shooting, with. getting shot. <laughs> God, really, and those frigging slugs, they hurt when they hit you. <laughs> they do. Hit you in the fucking I know head. this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the back um, of the calf is no, but I was in. I was. I was there, and I was trying to do the repo work and. Uh, and everyone was carrying guns. Everyone had guns. We was involved in shootouts. And is it time for a bin tank? No, another there time. Go. Yeah. A word from our sponsor, a bin tank. Yeah. Thank you very much. A and, star um, of ours. No, a friend of mine had, he, he's like, dude, you, you know, if you're going up in those hoods, you gotta, you got to be covered. Just, and it was, this was at the beginning of the crack epidemic. Right. So it wasn't like normal people you're dealing with. We would go to the projects. You know, I mean, every day we were up there, there were shootouts between the cops and this. Mm. You know, we were... I mean, they thought we were so free. I had this, you know, this Israeli guy had these piercing blue eyes, and I mean, I'm looking like fucking Fabio walking in. Sounds like some kind of Tarantino. Oh, it's a total Tarantino you know, movie. Maybe, and he yeah. and a friend of mine said, "Look, young, I think you need to, just in case, you know, you need this." And he and he gave me a nine mil, and um, of course it was illegal. And yeah, and I started, I started carrying, and then you get used to it, you know. Mm. And then, uh, you know, years after when I opened up my first restaurant and clubs. Then I, of course, I had a carry permit, and I was allowed to carry. But uh, oh wow! But um, yeah. But no, okay, yeah. so it's the clubs. Let's talk about the clubs. Biz- yeah. So all the repo yeah. stuff finished, and things went right. on. And then I, I mean, started you to became work with- you became uh, the king of clubs in New York. I mean, I think that's what you're probably still most famous the for. The Godfather of nightlife. <laughs> the Godfather of nightlife. I mean, you you in New York as a British. I started guy. as a waiter. No, I right. you know, when all the businesses crashed, and you know, and, and the repo and. All of that, and I was like, "This is not going to end well." So let me. So I was. There was this really cool place on the Upper West Side called Cafe Pacifico. Actually, Bruce Willis worked across the road. Mariah Carey. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone's a waiter in New York before right. they make it big. You know? Oh yeah. So, so it was this cool. And I used to go there and buy bottles of champagne, and we had the rolls and you know the Porsches, and we were like, you know, the best table. It was like a restaurant, cafe, lounge, club, whatever. And um, and then when we lost everything. I went back and there was this incredibly charismatic woman called uh, Gloria DeMann, who was a big Italian family in New York. And, um, and I went to her, I was like, Gloria. I, I, and, uh, and she was like, what do you need, honey? You need a job? And I was like, I need a job. She goes, yeah, I like, I like that. Good, you come and work with us. You're cute, you're cute. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> Half her clientele was gay, so she had us all dressed up in fucking pink tights and right. God knows what we were wearing. <laughs> But I still had the role, so I come to work as a waiter, and I still had the blue Rolls voice Brilliant. shadow. Oh, it's blue, was it? Powder wow. blue shadow. Powder too. blue. Good um, God, you couldn't get away with that in Brighton, though, could you? Get away with 
that. No. They'll be throwing rocks at you. Jesus but, uh, Christ. And then you told me one day that uh, you'd, you mean you'd served all sorts of people, right? I served every, I mean, everyone. There was, was and, an, and, Andy Warhol was a, is a story. Andy Warhol was know, one, yeah. You know. Crazy Andy, Mick Jagger. I mean, all of them. But I used to go to every table and just to have fun with it. Yeah. I used to have a different character. So yeah, one day I would be Fritz from Munich. What would you like to eat? <laughs> And the next day I'd be like, je m'appelle Raymond, qu'est-ce que tu veux manger? And the next day I'd be I would make up all these characters and serve the tables. I was obviously overqualified to be a waiter. Clearly. <laughs> I, I unionised the place after two months and took over as manager. <laughs> and uh, I had everyone else work. And, um, and it was crazy and it was wonderful and it was incredible and there was tears. And I mean, we used to do, you know, four days straight, day and night work. And then we go and, you know, do all kinds of fucking drugs late night and, then we go to the clubs and mm. I didn't sleep for four or five days at a time. Yeah. But I networked the whole of New York and, um, and then I started doing parties. Mm. Then I raised some money on my first restaurant, which was just right at the time when, when the whole super not, supermodel phenomena was, was coming in. It was a time when, uh, you know... Uh, the, the, uh, Cindy Crawford. Yeah, and, Cindy yeah, now, and we yeah. Christie, all of them. Mm. And, you know, and the Swedes, and they were all friends, so... So when I opened up my first restaurant, of course I invited them, and then, and then came Joe Pesci. What was the uh, what was the what was the first restaurant called? It was called Metro CC Metro Club, and Me- I've got another name for him, but I can't say it. Metro Cafe and Club. Okay. But yeah, you know, but we, and we opened on Seventeenth Street, and and it was a pretty much a no go area. But by the time you know two weeks in, we had a thousand people outside right. trying to. I had Bobby De Niro, I had Jack mm. Nicholson, mm. Joe Pesci, supermodels, Angie Everhart. Mm. Now, I mean, everyone was there. Was Joe Pesci's just one of those he's guys. And he's an actor, but he's, he's still even in person. Absolutely he's terrifying. terrifying. He's I, mean, I had lunch. He's, he's worse than you know he, your I archetypal had, kind I, uh, of mafia. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's just well, he's the real he scares deal. the shit he's out. He's the real joke. He scared me. Um, and I've met all of them, John mm. Cotty, all the Gambinos, the fucking Bananos, all of them, I know them all. But uh, I had lunch with Joe and Joe was dating Angie Everhart. My, she's like my sister, the red-headed supermodel. So uh, she's like, you know, Joe's in town, you know, I want to see you, you want to come and have lunch? So we go and have lunch and Joe's sitting there chewing on a toothpick, looking at me like he's about to fucking stab me in the face. Right. And, uh, and of course he's... He's also oh, a little, you know, you know, people get jealous and you right. know, he's my sister. And, yeah, he's quite and short. he's looking at me and I uh, just I'm gonna, I can say that now because he's not here. He's short. <laughs> he's a very short chap. How fast is this podcast going? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope not that far, and, uh, yeah. I sat there and I, I was, you know, in the beginning I was like, hi, Joe, really nice to see you. Uh, meet love you, you movies. Like, just yeah. Me, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chewing on his tooth. I thought he was going to stab me with a fork Fuck. the entire lunch. And eventually I, I got the cue. I was like, he wasn't comfortable with me being around Angie. Right. We were too close. And Angie was on on to, on, uh, on eggshells. But um, but then, you know, we got up and he was like, gave me a smile. But, oh, dude, he's fucking terrified. Yeah. Mm. And I've met him all. He's terrified. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. He's two foot tall, but he's fucking terrified. No, no, he is. I mean, even now, I'm going to dream about him tonight. He's going to just, that's going to ruin my fucking evening. Yeah, Bobby know. De Niro, you know, he's an actor. Or Jack he's, is, you know, he's an actor, Jack right? Jack is Jack. Yeah, and Jack is Jack. And all, Jack, and all these actors, guys are just actors. Joe no Pesci, problem. Don't right? give an inch, no, man. fuck, man. No, he's, he's the real deal. <laughs> yeah. Who else is there like that, I think, in the movies? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. I got, I got, I, I, you know, of course, you know, the Metro turned into Flowers, turned into this one, and Lotus. And, you know, I think, you know, over the years, we've probably had 20, 30 of them. Right. Top clubs in the world, mm. restaurants and clubs, and, and I get the Bowery. This was that one of yours? Yeah, Bowery was one of our. Well, we we actually we did all the events at Bowery. Right, right. Um, but but it, I just you know I get to meet I got to meet all these every you know, celebrity supermodel this and that. But I get yeah. to meet them after ten o'clock at night. Yeah, when so I'm not off work I'm not selling them insurance or sure, pulling right. out their teeth. I'm giving right, them right. a good time. But I'm yeah. also providing, you know, provided and do still provide. You know, obviously with with Savaya. Um, is a, a safe environment for them to come and party and play. Sean Penn, he's my favourite. Sean's a good friend. Um, you know, they're safe. I'm not going to... He also slightly scares me, Sean Penn. Sean, 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 Sean. I mean, I wouldn't fuck with Sean Penn. Yeah, Sean, Sean's rowdy. You he's know? a poet. You know, at night time, you know, he's, we, we had a room at Lotus upstairs in the club there and it was called the Peter Beard room. It just seems to me like the kind of guy you just don't want to get in a fight with. Do you yeah, know what no, I mean? He, I think he, he could but probably... But he's not... He's not the, Tallest, biggest. No, but he's guy. short. But, but yeah, he's, he's a scrapper. You know? He's a scrapper. He's a definitely right, scrapper. Yeah. And but, he, he, he doesn't take any. Which is why shit. it's funny when you see him at three in the morning, you know, a couple in, right. reciting poetry. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then you go, oh, he's an actor. Okay, we're cool. Yeah. Joe Pesci, you never see doing poetry. No, you never see him doing poetry. No. <laughs> so, yeah, so fuck that part. He's incredible. You know, I, I mean, I, I called my mum one night. I had, a, I had a moment with, you know, Jack Nicholson and I. Hmm. 
what we thought was a toilet, it wasn't. It was a broom cupboard. And, you know, of course, we were... <laughs> it's an easy mistake to make crazy. at three o'clock in the morning. And I, I called my mum. I said, Mum, you're never going to believe who I've just done a bump with. <laughs> a bump with Jack. <laughs> Jack Nichols. Oh, darling, do be careful. You know, I was, like, uh, you know, I was wiping the guy's face off, like, you know, with a tissue. Uh, all the, just incredible moments of story. Yeah. We're all, you know, everyone's human. I, I get to see... The you know the, the the I get to see the humanity, but I get to mm. see without you know when the guards drop down and I'm taking care of I'm hosting and it's the hot club it's always, it makes it easier. Right. But uh, but I always provide us and in all the which is why our clubs were always so hot and we well, had the biggest safe following. Space, right? I mean, we we yeah. didn't rat them out the next day to the press yeah, and these days yeah. now everyone and their mothers has got a fucking phone and TMZ yeah, and yeah. they rat each other out. But yeah. you know back then you didn't do we didn't you know we'd yeah. always we'd place a story and say you know. You know, Sean was here, or you, sure. know, you know, Ben Affleck was here, or you know, Tom Cruise it, was, was here. It was never the but you we know, never gave them yeah, the bad stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't want to fuck. We have to tell them. What's you, the point? Yeah. You know, the guys get bad for business. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. it's just you hey, can't do Jack, it. You know, suck me off. Yeah, the broom <laughs> well, I've seen it all. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. Just hey, shout it. out to Jack, by the way. Shout out listening. to Jack. Hey, Jackie boy. Jack is the king. Yeah, man, the he king. is the king. I wonder if the kids these days even know who Jack Nicholson. They don't. You see, you see, that's just unbelievable to me. But we do. Jack Nicholson, he's, I mean, he's, no. I mean, everybody bows down to Jack. I'm not going to say was. He is. But is. Jack's still, yeah. And he's still, but he's like, well, he's he, not as active as he used to be. <laughs> he's still, <laughs> still out stop, there. cut, <laughs> beep, beep. Yeah. So be. anyway, some great memories, um, some good times. Oh, man. You've yeah. had a fucking life. Fucking incredible. And then, but, you know, time catches up and, and club life and, you know, we weren't just doing yeah. clubs in New York. We were doing events all over the every fashion Sure, week. and I'm, I'm imagining, I'm seeing the, the narrative arc here. It must have come to some sort of horrible end. Yeah, it was just, we, we, we fortunately it didn't come to that horrible end, which is right. you have a heart attack and you fucking right. die. Right. Um, but I saw the writing on the wall, you know, my, my clubs. Um, you know, I got to a point where I had to... Oh, it's a cash flow business, right? And you're borrowing no when you're. Money we were making. It was nuts. Yeah, but I guess borrowing while you're up as well. And yeah, then... but it was just. But it, but it takes. You know, I mean, we again, we weren't just doing clubs in New York and restaurants in New York. We were doing events all over the world. Right. I was. I, mean, I was on a jet every every three days to Cannes, Paris, London, Milan, mm. Moscow. I've spent a lot of time in Russia. Wow. Um, we were doing it because we had the hottest clubs in New York. So every time there was a, you know, a, a fashion week or a Grand Prix or right. a, art. Or film festival, we were there Off doing the go. parties and yeah, all our yeah. celeb following right. and supermodel following came with us. Um, but then it just started to become monotonous, and I wasn't mm. really inspired by it anymore. And it was becoming more abusive, and I needed you know more drinks and you know, a few more to get out of a few bed. more rails to, to, to get, get out there and bed. go hug and kiss everybody every yeah. fucking night. So, right. and then there was this wonderful, you know, incredible new generation that came up, you know, of of, of these. I won't call them. I call them my kids because but, but they're, 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 they're they're young men. Who now own pretty much, you know, you know, Vegas came in. The, I mean, we're talking. I mean, we make millions. These guys make billions, you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, and they they they're business people, and they weren't doing the drugs, and, and yeah. we were partying hard. So I just saw the writing on the wall. And I thought, you know, it's time to retire gracefully. So I got sober in New York. Um, opened up a juice company, cold pressed juice, because I was doing the healthy thing as opposed to the unhealthy thing. And um, and you know, the company blew up. I was like, you know, if I'm if I'm not partying, nobody else can party. So yes, drink your juice. <laughs> we trade it around New York. Everyone be like, oh fuck, here comes Mark with that fucking Jesus. that juice here again. Here he comes. Yeah. <laughs> the company blew up. And not become not the fucking green one as well. Just yeah. not the guy with the juices again. Yeah. But uh, but it turned into a hundred million dollar company, and we huh. you know I make sure make you know make bank off of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to get into Bali in, in, in a bit yeah. uh, quickly because we're we're you know way into the time. <laughs> I, I could do this for I like could do this fucking for hours too, two Jesus. weeks. You know, <laughs> just sitting here. I think By there's the way, more beer I, I, in the fridge. I mean. Everything that's happened, everything that's, you know, I, I hate that word blessed, but arriving safe in Bali, I'm blessed. Yeah. I just, I just look back at all of the stuff, which, which I don't really. It's, all, it's been like a nonstop. It's a daily. It's been daily survival. It hasn't been this always glamorous, wonderful. There's been a price to pay of you know failed relationships. Well, we've had two wise. years of it as well, man. And uh, you and know, the, the, let's call, sort of talk briefly about the cold press uh, juice business here, because you, you brought that to Bali. I mean, you started yeah. it in New York, and you, you brought that to Bali, and now it's like. Everybody does it. It's always been about juice here, Told but then you. Uh, you did the cold press juice, and, uh, and no one ever—I'd never heard of that. And then one day you 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 sent over um, uh, a, a case of it to uh, to the yak, yeah. you know, while I was there, and I drank it. Man, I felt so fucking good. Okay. I mean, I got high off it. it, it you was. know, it was incredible. So, it, it, you know, it, it got me looking. No, I. I, I I don't know what is it. What is it about that? Is it, it just going to? It was a device that that, that you could. You it's, know, it's, it, when I was in New York and, and I was compressed. To be honest, best of. I, I stopped 
doing the bad stuff, you know, I was partying a lot. And, um, and of course I was skinny and I felt, you know, like shit. I was rotting on the inside, but I, but I, look, I look good. But, um, but when I stopped, you know, doing the bad stuff, I, I put on like fucking 15, like 15 kilos. Yeah. I became a beast because right. I was going home at night and eating five burgers as opposed to not eating for three days. Right. And uh, a friend of mine came to me and says, Mark, dude, I know you're sober now, God bless you, and you're going to meetings and all of that, but you, you're looking like, you look, you, you look like a hippo. So I, I know, and I'm miserable. I want to just go back and, you know, blast an ankle. And um, anyway, so I've got something. You've got to do this cold press juice. You've got to go on a three-day juice cleanse. It's going to just reset you. You've got to get rid of all the sugars, the salt, all the bad stuff, and reset your body. So, so I did three days, and I just I said, oh, fuck, this yeah. is really good. No, the first time you this do is it, really it's good, amazing. You know, thing, and I felt it? great, and that just gave me inspiration to stick with it. So, look, it's not just like, you know, juicing is going to you know, overnight going to change your life. It's just going to reset your thought. So, so I did it, and then, of course, I, I felt so good, as opposed to feeling so awful, hangover every morning. Right. Um, I started to, to, to you know, push all my celebrity friends to, to, to get it, and they got into it. And it wasn't just like, like a, a fad that, that came and went after six months. It, it worked, and people came back and came back, and, you know, which is right. why the company turned out into such a huge company. Right. And, um, and it's done wonders for me. So when I came to Bali... And I, I remember the first time I was like, cold press, everyone was like, cold who? What? And yeah. 50,000 for a juice, what? are you yeah. crazy? It's 10. No, I said, you've got to understand the process of what it takes to press this juice slowly and carefully and mix it, put it in a glass bottle and serve it cold. And um, I know everyone said I was mad. Remember? Yeah. Squeeze, a townhouse. Yeah. And, um, but now everyone's doing it. Yeah. So now we just have to do it better. Yeah. So now we've got organic farms. And we, you know, we grow all the, our own real organic produce. And it, it, you know, it's, look, it's not about money for me for this one. It's just, I love, I love making stuff. You know, I've spent half my life selling people alcohol and bad habits. You know, now, now I get to make them feel good, mm. which, um, which I'm really proud of. And uh, what's the name of the company? Uh, it's called uh, In the Raw. In the Raw. So it's In the Raw. We got juice. We got you know, these uh, organic farms now, which, is, which I get to run around the mountains up in Badugal in the north with my pack of wolves and. Barefoot and you know, and try and do some good stuff. You know, it's so incredible. I'm, I'm really happy with it. Let's so, talk about the wolves a bit. You know, so uh, you were the yeah. So you've got wolves. I mean, you know, <laughs> if anybody's seen you on social media or whatever, then that, then it's quite obvious that there are large uh, dog-like animals uh, around. The clearly not your your regular house pet. You know. And they're not Labradors and stuff, and they look a bit... They're not Huskies, and you think, well, it looks a bit like a Husky, but it's it's like twice like the size wolf. of a fucking Husky. It looks a lot like a fucking wolf. So, <laughs> I mean, we're in Indonesia, man, and it is um, an issue uh, with, with animals, obviously, uh, being brought into a country like, like this because... You know, like Australia protecting its uh, natural kind of uh, wildlife and what have you. Then, then uh, in in Bali, they also don't want a million uh, other breeds of, of either totally agree. Yeah, dogs or people. Really, totally. I mean, you know. Uh, so, so there has always been a small industry of exotic kind of uh, breeds mm -hmm. of dogs here. You know, small dogs and stuff like that, and huskies, and there's a lot of interbreeding that goes on. But bulls. Yeah, right, well, big, pit, like, yeah, big, yeah, big a lot of pit bulls. Yeah, but, uh, look, I, I but, was, but, but tell us about, so Wolfie, I remember <laughs> seeing the first picture of Wolfie, and I don't know if you want to talk about this because it's, uh, it's, th it's a thing, but, you know, I saw a picture of Wolfie like um, like a, a Captain Blackbeard on the, on the prow <laughs> of this wooden boat <laughs> right. having undertaken this incredible journey Learning, from Russia, Russia uh, where... Yep. Uh, he or she? Merlin was the first. Merlin, right. I, I, you know, I moved to Bali with my girl Jenny. We had all these plans for kids and, and, uh, and you know, living happily ever after and all of that. And then it didn't quite work out. So, so Jenny went back to America um, and, you know, townhouse clothes. And it was a, it was a really... The was, club that you had. Yeah, yeah it was a, the townhouse was a big one. It was, it was, a, it was a difficult period, you know, as, as Bali can be, and it challenged me a lot. You know, back in America, you know, when I had... A free moment, you know. I would go to the countryside, and one of the places I would go to was a wolf was a wolf rescue place. Anyway, right. I'm in Bali. I'm sitting. I was like, you know what? I, I really, I'd love to have a wolf, yeah. or at least you know, a hybrid wolf, wolf dog. Yeah. So, um, so one thing led to another, and some friends in Russia, and there's a special breed there that, that that's uh, that the Russian military has, has been breeding. They're extremely difficult to get. I had friends in the military. We had some favors. Blah blah blah. Eventually, you know, I got one of the one of these puppies to to come to to, to Jakarta and yeah. then come to Bali. I went through the process. Right. 
Duke had to come out of Europe. It was yeah, it was it was complicated and it was expensive. Yeah. Um, and then you know I spent you know the first two three years with Merlin, um, you know my alpha, my alpha male. And then I was like you know he needs a girlfriend, so we went through another two year process and I got a female, and then they had puppies. And um, how many have you got now? Or have you? Well, bred? then then then, but at the same time before the puppy thing, I I always wanted a white Arctic wolf because they're just incredible and they're beautiful and they're very special and very rare. And so four years, four or five years ago, I started the process to, to, to get, you know, uh, a, a well, not well trained, a well, not domestic, you can't domesticate them, but, but as domesticated as you can be, a good lineage of a stable animal um, of, of, Arctic, of Arctic. So eventually, after like three years, three and a half years of, of them trying to breed, um, there, there was a litter. And I got the white Arctic wolf, which is, you know, he's the big boy now. Mm. He's only 10 months old, but he's massive. But, How uh, many um, So uh, I have, in my house, I have, uh, I have uh, six now. Um, wow. um, uh, and there are puppies out there, some, a couple in Jakarta, a few in Bali. Um, and they're my whole life. They're my kids, you know, so I'm not going to have kids anymore. Yeah, right. and that's... Uh, and I, I, we sleep together, eat together. We spend, you know, the thing about COVID has, has allowed me to spend time with these puppies as they grow. So we are a pack now, and uh, I just they're my they're my everything, you know. Mm. I mean, and you know, and, and they're also. It's I've seen you um, uh, again social media, just uh, off in the in the forest in the botanic gardens, yeah, here, yeah. In, in the mountains yeah, with mountains. them. That must be incredible. It it's looks incredible. incredible. We know, we know, to see these guys in the forest howling, you know, it's it's just. I mean, look, there's something special about wolf. They are incredible, incredible creatures. Even the hybrids, you know, I've got, you know, two full wolf and the rest are, the rest are high content hybrids. Um, they're just incredibly smart. And they're but you, you're covering like a, a massive distance in the forest and you can hear them? Yeah, you know, we, we, I let them run and, and we howl at each other. And mm. yeah, no, it's, it's National Geographic shit. Wow. But it's, you know, and I get, you know, and it's colder up there. So it's, and we've got the farms there. So it's just, it's, 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 it's part of a lifestyle, you know. Incredible. I'd like to be out in nature. Okay, okay. The fact that's you know, I just you mentioned Russia. I don't think we can go past uh, that word right now, uh, given what's Without going on in the world, and uh, just mentioning you know, obviously Ukraine and um, Bali, of course, attracts uh, all nationalities. And uh, there is a uh, there is a large Russian population, and there's also a large you know, uh, there are Ukrainians here, and there are people from from uh, the area that um, is now uh, the centre of uh, the news and of. Uh, uh, terror, if you like, and, yep. and suffering. Um, where are you with that? I, I, look, I think for, we've had two years, the whole world has had two years of separation, confusion, fear, anxiety, COVID, um, vax, no vax, QAnon, Donald Trump. I mean, this has really been a testing time and, 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 and extremely fearful time for people across the world. And now suddenly at the end of it, just as, as you know, the final sort of hopefully COVID wave comes through, now suddenly you have you know, a potentially unstable Eastern Europe and Europe. Um, I, have, I have incredible Russian friends. I have incredible Ukrainian friends. And, and if you really, you know, if you dealt, you know, without getting into the whole political stuff of it, you know, obviously what's happening right now is absolutely, it's just awful. Um, what I think we in Bali... You know, you know, it's no point in tackling the whole world's problems because obviously, you know, you could go on for hours about politics, and and we all know what's happening right now is is a travesty. You know, you know, when you get civilians involved in you know political conflicts, it's just you know, those are the ones that suffer, and that's just awful. So there's no excuse for that. Um, what I, what I'm more sort of you know focused for as, as somewhat of as a, a community leader here in Bali is is that the, you know you have families and friends that have been friends for long, long time with deep roots in between Russia and Ukraine is that our community doesn't start, you know, I mean, you know, there are you know, tensions and, and emotions run high. And, you know, the idea is, you know, Bali has always been a place where we will come together, whatever nationality you are, and, and we, we find a place together in this beautiful, peaceful, magical place that, that, that we call home, which is Bali. And, you know, just you can see the mood on social media, on the streets, everywhere. It's, you know, people, people are exhausted already. Now we have a potential major, major we have a situation happening, but, you know, the, the potential for it to, to spread and go wider is, is there. And, you know, I think it's, it's you know, people are, people, are, people are confused, people are scared, and, and from that emotions run high and then, you know, words are said, posts are done, reactions are made. And it's just, you know, you know, I've spent the past couple of weeks just, you know, as we always do, like a 
of the community leaders. It was just to try and s sort of soothe tensions and, and sort of negotiate a little bit here and there. If somebody makes a post that perhaps doesn't appeal, that's misunderstood, and suddenly mm. you've got a whole community. Yeah. You know, I had a Russian friend who posted something, and, 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 and it, ju it just came out wrong. So you had, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of big community of Ukrainians ready to go and fucking burn his restaurant down, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't his intention because he's half Ukrainian. So, so it's just about you know, like you know, Bali is this. Well, Bali is about love, right, and exactly. about community and about nature, and, and exactly. that's uh, what we all hope to promote. Mark Baker, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Thank you I want to just uh, uh, let people know how they can uh, get in touch with you and um, where they can connect. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, we have a lot of we have a lot of fun stuff going on in Bali. Not just the juice and the restaurants and the farms. Um, we also have Savaya. Savaya's a you know beautiful day club up on the cliff. Which Savaya, we yeah, Savaya. aka uh, previously. Are we allowed to mention the name? There's no need to say it's no, Savaya. Okay. Everyone Savaya. Knows Savaya. <laughs> okay. um, up on the cliff. Um, mm. It's a but, beautiful spot, by the you know, way. Thank you. I mean, you know, music brings people together. But um, in the raw, um, organic farms in the raw juice. Um, message WhatsApp uh, on on Instagram. Stay healthy, barley. You know, let's get through this together. Um, the world needs a lot of love right now, and, and we've. Um, this is the. I think you know. If you look at the whole world and the conversations I have with everyone around the world, I mean, you've got Leo DiCaprio's on the island now with Toby. He's doing a retreat here. Yep, he's here. Uh, post COVID, everybody wants to come to Bali. Let's let's shine. Let's yeah, let's man. be a great community and let's, welcome the world. Let's get and, Joe, uh, and let's Joe Pesci the, over here. You know, maybe you know. not Joe. <laughs> and, <laughs> Mark, uh, man, let's, let's spread Bali love, baby. Bali love yeah. worldwide. All right, cheers. You. Love you. Love you too. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs>